I don't think I have the ability to do that. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Trevor. All right, I'll just do that little intro again. I'm uh, very happy to introduce our, our main speaker this evening. Nicole Schland is a local housing rights advocate, um, and she's the author of an excellent report entitled COVID-19, The Beginning of the End of Homelessness. Um, she has been tirelessly working to push for uh, progressive, forward-thinking solutions to the housing crisis. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing all of the great things that she has to tell us this evening. Thanks very much, Nicole, for agreeing to join us. And when uh, Nicole has finished her presentation, uh, we will have some actions to discuss after that and an opportunity for everyone to share their thoughts. So thanks so much with that uh, to you, Nicole. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Um, ben, would you be able to put up my um, presentation? Yes, please? I just wanted to make sure people could see you, but who is oh, okay. addressing the, the, oh, there you are in the corner. Awesome. Yeah, great. Yeah, so just flip back to the first uh, slide, please, and then we'll, we'll get going. It's our first one of these folks, so we'll <laughs> get it sorted. Yeah, lots of familiar faces here and lots of familiar names, maybe from Twitter. So nice to make the jump from Twitter to Zoom. Somehow we're getting more human, but step by step. Okay, I'm gonna put my uh, timer on to keep track of myself. So let's, so let's get started. So there's, there's two parts to this presentation. Part one, we're going to focus on social housing and part two, missing middle housing. Uh, next slide, please. So extreme core housing need is a reliable metric we can use for understanding the housing crisis. And we need a metric like this to be able to measure whether or not our housing interventions are making any difference. Uh, so we, we need some sort of tool like core housing need or extreme core housing need uh, just, just to be able to know, is, is the housing situation getting better or is it getting worse? So what is it? So a household is said to be in core housing need if it falls below one of three standards, adequacy, suitability, and affordability. The majority of, of households are in core housing need because they are not meeting the affordability standard. So uh, the affordability standard means a household uh, is able to um, achieve adequate and suitable housing while not paying more than 30% of their income on rent. In recent years, the federal government has created a, this new metric that you're looking at now, extreme core housing need. It has the same definition, but it means that a household is paying 50% of its income on rent. So we can notice several things from this chart. So first of all, we notice that there's 10,480 households in our region, in the capital region, who have incomes that are lower than $23,000 a year and paying more than 50% of their income on rent. We also notice that there are relatively few households earning more than $44,000 per year who are paying more than half of their income on rent. The other thing we can notice by looking at this chart is that affordable for uh, those households earning less than 23,000 a year means $375 to $550 per month. I like to include that so people can really take it home and really understand the meaning of this. The, the, the meaning of this is that we need 10,000, we have a backlog of 10,000 homes that rent for 375 to $550 per month. One final thing before moving on from this slide. So we can also observe knowing what we know about the um, uh, rental market, rents being $1,500 a month for a one bedroom apartment. So we can observe that rents need to fall by about $1,000 monthly before they become affordable to the lowest income group. Next slide, please. So um, actually, could you go back one slide, please? 
Yeah. Okay. So what can we do with this information? Well, you can ask critical questions of your counselors and your planning department. So if your municipal housing strategy uh, proposes to uh, resolve the housing crisis by accelerating new market supply, you may want to ask critical questions such as how much new market supply needs to be built before rents decrease by 100, 200, 500, $1,000 per month. You might want to ask how many years uh, before rents decline 10, 20, or 50%. The research on the impacts of new market supply on housing markets shows that new market supply helps mitigate rent increases. So it helps slow down the uh, amount that rents are going up. Now, I don't want any of this to be understood as an argument against new market housing. A supply shock of new rentals will give tenants more power and more choice. However, I do hope that the takeaway is that new market supply is not a viable strategy to remove households from extreme core housing need. For that, we need a more ambitious program of social housing. We need a massive uptick in the construction of social housing. Uh, next slide, please. This is a quote from Tom Armstrong, the CEO of the Co-op Housing Federation of BC. He says, governments have to decide if they're willing to allow housing to continue to be an asset class in someone's investment portfolio, or if they're interested in creating market conditions in which housing can simply be a home for someone. The Okay. This means building a lot of cooperative and social housing. Next slide, please. Nicole, we, we, you briefly cut out. Could you just repeat the last 10 or 15 seconds of Tom Armstrong's quote? Oh, sure. I don't, I'm not sure if people can read the quote there, but I'll, yeah. So Tom, Tom Armstrong says, um, governments have to decide if they're willing to allow housing to continue to be an asset class in someone's investment portfolio, or if they're interested in creating market conditions in which housing can simply be a home. And the most direct and efficient way to ensure homes are for living in and not for investments is to remove homes from the market. This means building a lot of co-op and a lot of social housing. Next slide, please. So co-op housing is a form of social housing. And for the past several decades in Canada, social housing has been mixed income housing. About 20 to 30% of all social housing uh, built today rents for 375 to 550 a month. And the rest is 70 to 80% of all units in social housing are for incomes higher than $20,000 a year, all the way up to $100,000 a year. Social housing in Canada is for everyone. This chart shows that social housing fell off a cliff in the 1990s in Canada. Next slide, please. Canada has one of the most privatized housing markets of advanced capitalist economies. Next slide, please. And it also has one of the highest rates of homelessness. Uh, Top housing homelessness experts in Canada link uh, the withdrawal from, uh, in the 90s from social housing with the rise of mass homelessness in Canada. Uh, next slide, please. Let's take a look at what's happening locally. So over a two year period, the city of Victoria approved just over 2,900 market rate units and 657 social housing units. You can see the income mix in the buildings there although it isn't completely clear to me what below market means. But the big takeaway uh, here is that in a two year period, the city approved 190 homes for the lowest income bracket. So only 10,290 to go. Um, I've chosen to focus on the lowest income bracket for two reasons. One, for every one home that's built that is affordable to this income bracket, there are four additional social housing units built for higher income brackets. 
For every one home that's built for the lowest income bracket, there are 14 market homes built for higher incomes. So one unit of social housing affordable to the lowest income is a proxy for 18 higher income homes. Building housing for the lowest income group directly benefits all income groups. Um, for every new unit of housing uh, built uh, at deeply subsidized rates, there's 18 units of housing built across the spectrum. The second reason uh, that I chose to focus on um, the lowest income group is because prioritizing housing for the most in need is a human rights standard. And I'll talk about that just closer to the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. We need a new vision and a renewed commitment to social and public housing in Canada. Next slide, please. This says we can have beautiful public housing, but the truth is we already have beautiful public housing in Canada. This is Camas Gardens on Humboldt Street. It's a well-located supportive housing building for people exiting homelessness. It was built to lead gold standards. And I think everyone would agree it's a very beautiful building. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, there's two actions municipal governments in our region should take to accelerate social housing construction. One is the ongoing public acquisition of land. And two is to prioritize affordable and social housing through extra density and expedited procedures. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so that was part one, social housing. Part two, missing middle housing. Next slide. Mark Lee is a senior economist for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And he released a new paper last week called Upzoning Metro Vancouver's Low Density Neighbourhoods for Housing Affordability. There are lessons in his report we can adapt to Victoria's Missing Middle Program, namely, next slide, please. Enabling missing middle forms such as secondary suites, multiplexes, townhouses, row houses, I think most of you know, small apartment buildings in all uh, single family neighborhoods. Mark proposes regulatory reforms that put conditional approval on these forms of housing um, for these, if they meet two conditions. So the first is do no harm. My neighbor, her husband and seven year old are moving into a vehicle because their rental home is being demolished uh, to make way for new condo construction. The developers of this project have exceeded the city of Victoria's tenant protection policies, but the policies are not good enough to guarantee that her human right to housing uh, has, has not been um, infringed upon. The tenant assistance policies are not strong enough to guarantee she can, can continue living in a residence um, that meets human rights standards in Victoria. So missing middle proposals need to have a robust system of tenant protection in place to ensure no one is displaced into homelessness, into another city or into core housing need. The second proposal that Mark makes is uh, to designate one third to one half of the units as affordable home ownership or rental. This is an important proposal to mitigate market-driven spatial segregation, which is kind of a pretty fancy way of saying uh, have and have not neighborhoods and address the question, the, the fairness question about who gets to live in what neighborhood, who gets to live in new missing middle neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So I don't know if there's any real estate developers in the audience, but if there are, I imagine they're doing something like this right now. Uh, this is a pro forma and a guy pulling his hair out. And uh, they'll tell you that missing middle proposals will not be viable if they have to pay for tenant protections and provide any level of affordability. But what I say is limiting our imaginations and aspirations to only those that fit within pro formas is not the way to go. This will only reinforce the existing uh, market-driven segregation that we currently have in our neighborhoods. 
Next slide, please. We have to be confident to put forward human values. We cannot footnote our values and say, they're only values if they're financially viable to be values. Um, coming together, articulating shared community values is at the core of functioning democracies and harmonious communities. We, one way to express our humanity is through government policy that reflects our shared values. And we should keep in mind that the economy works best as servant, not as master. Next slide, please. We did come together over a two year period uh, to create Victoria's official community plan. Um, this is a part, this is an excerpt from the official community plan showing that we want to live in diverse neighborhoods and that we value um, diversity in our neighborhoods. We just have not yet developed um, the mechanism to implement this value. Next slide, please. Burnaby is the gold standard for tenant protections and social housing. Tenants are offered first right of refusal at existing rents. They're also offered top up rent payments while they're in interim housing, waiting for their new apartment to be built. Um, they also have uh, spurred a social housing boom. And what I would say that they're doing that makes a lot of sense is they're taking a systemic approach. They have a huge suite of policies that are all working together to be able to reflect their community's values, which is no displacement into homelessness, core housing need, or neighboring municipalities. I'm not sure if we can take Burnaby's approach, lock, stock, and barrel, and implement it in Victoria, but we don't have to. The point of, of learning from Burnaby's story is that if one municipality can figure it out, another municipality can figure it out. Next slide, please. The tension between market forces and human rights is not going away anytime soon in our local housing market. I want to equip you with some tools to help advance housing, the right to housing for all. Next slide, please. Victoria's housing strategy acknowledges that housing is a human right. The federal government enshrined the right to housing for all Canadians in legislation in 2019. <laughs> Um, it's not a rallying cry. Housing is a human right. It's not a rallying cry. It's a, it's a set of standards that our municipal governments can choose to implement. Uh, so the first standard here is homelessness is a prima facie violation of the right to housing. That just means that at face value, homelessness uh, is a violation. You don't need to prove it in court. Governments are compelled to act uh, because people are having their human rights um, infringed upon. Uh, the, other, the other human rights standards are to prioritize those most in need, to respond in the shortest time possible, and to utilize the maximum available resources. And an important human standard is that rights claimants are guaranteed uh, dignity, effectiveness, and participation. Next slide, please. So to conclude, top municipal actions Victoria can take. One is ongoing public acquisition of land to spur new, a new level of investment uh, to take us away from the status quo level of construction for social housing, to prioritize affordable and social housing with density and prioritize it with expedited processes. Uh, three, conditional approval of missing middle housing that protects tenants from displacement and contributes to affordable housing. And four, introduce human rights standards. And thank you, that's it for me. Yes.